Well, we've got a unique opportunity here because we've got our Jeep 4.0 all apart down to the bare block. And we've also got fresh from the machine shop 225 slant 6 block. So I figured let's do a comparison between the two. And then I thought about it for a second and I says, no, wait, let's do a rundown on the history of Chrysler inline sixes. All of them. The flatheads, the slants, the Jeeps, the Hemi 265s, and I want to talk about the new Hurricane motor also, because it's, it's interesting in a lot of ways. But we'll get to that. So the Chrysler Flathead 6, previous to 1931, all of the companies that made up, that eventually made up Chrysler Corporation, had their own inlines. They had their own sixes. DeSoto, Chrysler, Maxwell, and Dodge all had inline sixes. But beginning in 1931, for the introduction of the new Plymouth, which was a corporate effort. And, and it was actually introduced as an upscale, high-technology car. You know, it's hard to think of a Plymouth as upscale and high-technology, but that's where, it was, that's where it was pointed. They introduced what they called the Floating Power 6. So this was a regular, it was a standard flathead engine. There was really nothing exotic about it. It's basically six Briggs and Strattons, you know, end to end. But it had a unique motor mount system called floating power. So what they did was instead of the typical mounting where you'd find ears or, or bosses on the side of the block for the mounts, what, what Chrysler did on that floating power six was use a cradle at the front and at the transmission. So the motor was free to kind of go like this. And these were like low torque engines and it was relatively light cars. So the leaning wasn't really that big of a deal but it did improve the overall feel of the car. So that was the big selling point for 1931. 1932 was incorporated across the board in Chrysler cars. But for the Plymouth, that was the big thing, a floating power six. Now here's a trivia having nothing to do with inlines. When Dodge brought out the Red Ram Hemi in 1951, the first incarnation of 1952, the first incarnation of it, the 241, it had no mounts on the sides of the block like all the other conventional Chrysler V8s. Instead, it had a horseshoe shaped thing with a floating power mount. And that lasted for, I believe it was three years until Dodge started putting the regular ears on the side of the block. So if you happen to come across one of those early Dodge Red Ram Hemis, watch out for that, because that could, that could be a real trap when you try to install it in something else. Enough of that. So. That inline six, in many different displacements, lasted until 1959. So now, at this point, Chrysler was really behind the eight ball as far as overhead valve inlines went, because everybody else had them. So Chrysler decided it was going to do two overhead valve inline sixes. One of them was going to be a compact motor dedicated to its new compact line, the Valiant for 1960. And the other one was going to be for the larger cars and light trucks, both overhead valve. Well, at the last minute, the bean counter said, well, you know what? We only really need one inline six. And so what they did was they added an inch of deck height to the 170 and created the 225. So let's just talk about the generic slant for a second. When the engineers were tasked to design this thing, they had one mission, and that was to make it as compact as possible, make it as low as possible, make it as short as possible. And because of that, you've got the Slant 6's unique layout of four main bearings. So now every other inline 6 you'll come across is going to have seven mains. It's just the natural way to set up an inline 6. The Slant only has the four because they needed to move the bores as close together as possible to make the block as short as possible. The all of the Slant 6s, the 170, the 198, and the 225, all have the same 3.4 inch bore. And that was again in the name of shrinking the motor front to back as much as possible. The distance, the difference between a conventional 7 main inline 6 like this 4.0 is that this one measures 28 inches from back face to front face. And the Slant 6 is 26 inches from back to front. Two inches doesn't seem like a big deal overall, but when you're trying to make this thing fit into a tiny car with a short, stubby, low hood, it made all the difference in the world. And that's why they went with this configuration. So they scrubbed 
the, the larger overhead valve inline for 1960. But it stayed kicking around in the background. So in 1966, Chrysler engineers were told, okay, we need to start developing a bigger, more potent six for our heavier cars and trucks. So they started working on an engine that was very similar to this Jeep, and we're going to get to the history of this in a minute. And they ended up with what eventually became the Australian Hemi 6. So here's what happened now. Chrysler developed a conventional length, seven main bearing, bigger bore in line six. And I believe, I believe at the time that they were influenced by Pontiac's efforts to build a high performance in line six, a domestic high performance in line six, with their overhead valve Tempest motor, overhead, overhead valve, overhead cam Tempest motor. Now the thing about that was Chrysler didn't want overhead cams, but they wanted that same basic performance image and potential out of it. So instead of making it a true inline wedge, they made it a canted valve engine, very similar to the big block Chevy or the Cleveland Ford or Chrysler's own polysphere. So it's not a true Hemi, but it's a canted valve engine. So the, the valves are tilted towards each other. They open kind of towards each other. At the last minute, that was scrubbed and it was put on the side. The motor was developed, it was designed, it was all good to go, but it was put on the side. In 1970, Chrysler of Australia picked up that design, and that's what became the Hemi 265. Now, I wish I had Hemi 265 knowledge and experience and parts to show you guys, and I get asked about that, that Hemi 6 so often, but none of them were ever imported here. None of them were ever produced here. I've never actually touched one, right? But you guys have them all over the rest of the world, and especially down in Australia. We never got them. So that's as far as my knowledge of them goes. Now I have compared pictures and, and as much information as I can find. And aside from the canted valves, it's actually very, very close to the four liter Jeep motor, which I want to talk about now. So this, the four liter, didn't start out as a four liter. This started out as the AMC Typhoon 6. And this was AMC's way to get away from the flathead six. They were the last people producing flathead sixes. So this was introduced in 1965. As like I said, the Typhoon six. And it was in production in AMC cars and trucks and Jeeps all the way up until 1987 when Chrysler bought Jeep, they took this, they got this motor in the deal. And Chrysler adopted it and refined it and made a few small changes here or there. But the engine is still essentially the same as the AMC engine. I do consider it, I know it's, it was born AMC, but I do actually consider it a Chrysler engine because it was produced by Chrysler for as many years as it was produced by AMC. And it has Chrysler's fingerprints all over the place. It's a really high quality engine. This is the first one that I've ever actually gone into and I'm impressed by everything that I see on it. So let's compare the 225, the Slant 6, to the Jeep motor. Aside from the obvious difference in the number of main bearings and the overall length of the block, and here are the cranks, and you can see the cranks are similar but different. The 225 has this massive counterweight here where there should be a main bearing or where you find a main bearing on the Jeep. But you can see just the general length difference, the height difference between these two. It's the same height difference as, as length difference in the block. It's about two inches. But it's an excellent high quality piece. Here are the connecting rods. And the Jeep rod is a little bit beefier than the slant rod. A little bit thicker in the beam section here. But here's the big difference. So this is the 3.4 inch slant 6. And here's the Jeep. So you can see there's, there's a significant difference in bore size. And therefore power producing potential. Cylinder heads. This is where you find another huge difference. So, this is a 225 head. This is a later peanut plug head, but 
the combustion chambers, the valve size, and the port size are all exactly the same as the earlier heads. All of these slants have the same size valves, the same size combustion chambers. No differences here. And here's the ports. Okay, so here's an exhaust and intake, exhaust, intake, exhaust, intake. And then here is the Jeep head. And look at the size difference in the valves. Much more capable engine. But you really see the difference when you compare the ports side to side. So what's what's this this hole here is a thermostat housing, the thermostat opening on the on the slant six head, and this is an exhaust port on the Jeep. So don't confuse those two. But um, look at the differences here. Here's a, a 225 slant six exhaust port, and look at the exhaust port on this thing. Huge difference. Here's an intake port on the Chrysler, and here's an intake port on the Jeep. There's like literally no comparison. It's apples and oranges. And now you're seeing why it's so hard to get power out of a Slant 6. They can make some power, but naturally aspirated, they're really limited. The Jeep head is much more along the lines of the bigger Ford and bigger Chevy cylinder heads. So much, much potential here. There are guys at turbocharged that make close to 800 horsepower out of these things. You couldn't, don't, you wouldn't even want to attempt that with a slant six. That four main bearing setup is adequate for moderate performance. You know, you get into the three, 400 horsepower range. Once you start going past that, it really becomes a liability. Whereas with the seven mains, there is nothing more stable in the bottom end of an, an inline, a seven main bearing inline six. Here's a trivia fact. As different as these engines are and as different as their history is, they take the same lifters. That wasn't really by design or anything like that. It was just circumstance. The lifters are interchangeable between Chrysler and AMC engines, and you can take these and go back and forth with them. All right, what else did I want to talk about as far as these things go? Oh, one other thing, the Jeep engines really spectacular short tube headers and when I first saw this it was like oh I got to adapt this to a slant six I mean how could I not right well you can't because on the Jeep head the two center ports are exhaust and on the Chrysler the the, the slant head the two center ports are intakes so the the spacing is completely off it won't work but that's that's the exhaust manifold that comes on a 4.0 Jeep. Beautiful stuff. So, Chrysler went for a while without an inline six after they canceled the 4.0, I guess it was in 2007. And now they're bringing out a new one. So that brings us to the present and the future of Chrysler inline sixes, the new hurricane. So. I got mixed feelings about this thing, and I'll, I'll explain. On the positive side, the motor is an engineering marvel. It's designed to take the place of the Hemi in production vehicles. It's supposed to mimic all of the feel of it, that instant torque, instant response. And this three liter engine, twin turbocharged, and I use two small turbochargers so that they spool quickly is making 500 some odd horsepower in production trim, currently in the Grand Wagoneer. And I've seen road tests on it, people are impressed by it, it sounds good, runs good, everything's good. And from a hot running standpoint, if there's any engine, any new engine out there that has the chance of like dethroning the, the two JZ as like king of the inlines, it may be this one. And I'm excited to see what hot riders do with it. Because if, if they're doing 500 and some odd horsepower production, imagine what you could do with this thing when you step on it, right? So that's the bright side of it. The downside of it comes from my pra like the practical mechanic in me that says, hmm, this thing is pushing 20 pounds of boost all the time. It's pushing a 6,000 pound Grand Wagoneer down the road, 60, 70, 80 miles an hour, pushing a lot of wind. This thing's always under boost, it's always under pressure. It may be fine for 50,000, 80,000, 100,000 miles maybe, but man, that's, you're asking a lot of this thing. So in my opinion, it's really overtaxed. I could be wrong, I hope I'm wrong. I hope that this thing becomes the new king, the new state of the art of inline sixes. I got my doubts though. 
time will tell, right? Keep, let's keep our fingers crossed because I tell you the truth, I would love to get my hands on it. I have no interest in doing a Hellcat or anything like that, but I would love to get my hands on one of these hurricane motors and stick it in one of our cars and see what it'll do. But for the time being, I'll stick with the four liters and my trusted, my beloved slant sixes. You know, I don't care what anybody says. When you doll these things up, they're just beautiful. All right, so that's it, guys. I hope you got something out of that. A quick rundown on the history and the technical aspects of the Chrysler inline sixes. I'll see you tomorrow.